basically, it's a pretty important <coughs> topic. And as John said, it is an international men, men's day, isn't it? And there is a debate in Parliament today, I think. There is, so. yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so the 19th. Sorry? International Men's Day is the 19th, but they had the uh, debate today. Yeah, had a debate today, yeah. Which is good news. So I've been working with the Samaritans for many years, uh, as you uh, probably need to know. Give me some context, I won't go into all my <laughs> background. This is just <coughs> stuff I always say at these kind of talks, because it, it does, unfortunately, it's an emotive subject. Uh, and we want to just get it clear, this is a very inclusive approach. You know, we, we want to promote the understanding of, of one gender. It has no, it doesn't imply a lack of concern for, for the other. It's just that we're focusing on men because of, for, for obvious reasons. But sometimes I get a little in the way when people sort of say, uh, you know, why are you focusing on men? And I say, well, if you focus on children, no one says, why, why aren't you focusing on people? They just, they're specialists. And of course, I, I spent my whole career working mainly with women because we'll find out, as we all know, women turn up for help more in the NHS and counselling services than men. So I specialised in women more than men, but as I got into my 40s and 50s, <laughs> realising I need to think about men as having a gender in, in the same way and one of the differences. So understanding both genders is, is very important, to understand humanity. Uh, gender's a motive, but then everything is really, it should be, anything worth thinking about is, is a motive. Uh, Gender difference doesn't imply common humanity, so men and women equally human. But these could be. <coughs> Hi, please come in, grab a oh, seat. We've only just started because of technical oh, difficulties, really? so you haven't really missed very much. Lovely, thank you. Uh, so, I so, say <coughs> diversity, uh, for me, gender is a diversity and an equality issue. Because you're interested in difference and diversity, it doesn't mean to say you're not e interested in equality too. It's, it's both as it would be with any other area of life. So, so suicide is a massive a killer, okay? So just looking at the most common cause of death, for men aged 20 to 49, it is actually the most common cause of death, even above all the sort of physical diseases. So that's quite amazing when you think about it. Killing your own, taking your own life is the most common cause of death. Also for women aged 20 to 34, so, you know, it's, it's a big issue. Oh, yeah. Hello. Okay, right. So, is that better? Okay. So, yeah, for uh, women, it's, it's a big killer as well between the ages of 20 to 34. Suicide is the second most common cause of death for teenage males. Uh, and it's the sixth for females. So. Basically, it's, the big, it's pretty much the biggest killer for, for males from teenage years through to, to about 50. I mean, that's a massive thing in our health, uh, in public health. It's a huge public health issue. But if you look at the Public Health England strategic plan, I don't know if you have, these things can be rather dry. It doesn't hardly mention mental health, you know, suicide, you know, let alone suicide. And it's, it's talking really about physical health and obesity and lifestyle choices and all that stuff. It doesn't really, it doesn't really feature mental health as part of an integrated part of all health, even though we talk about parity of mental and physical health. So I'm going to talk about two blindnesses in health, you know, when it comes to male suicide that we need to think about. The first is mind blindness. As a society, we're, we're not very psychologically literate. All of our uh, health science policy research, everything focuses on the brain, not the mind. And in fact, we have a sort of scientific culture which assumes that the mind is something soft. If you study the mind, you're, you're not a proper scientist. If you study the brain, you are a proper scientist. So there's a whole thing by which psychological data become uh, seen as second-class data. Mental health is only referred to, therefore, in medicalised terms as a set of disorders, uh, and it's not seen as part of the human condition, except as a sort of secondary thing. So this is why the public health strategy is so physicalised. It's based on it's based on physical assumptions. So really, when you look at public health in this country, if you were a public health expert, you'd really expect 
to be wanting to look at suicide as a massive thing in society. How do we prevent it? What do we do with our early relationships? What do we do with, with everything that relates to people's self-worth in society? But no, it just comes down to diet, behaviour, lifestyle. There isn't much curiosity about people's psychology in our public health strategy. We see mental illness as a cause of suicide. Uh, we, we put this sort of layer of explanation that people are suffering from mental illnesses, which is a, a false uh, model, because if you think about it, is feeling, having low self-esteem, is that a symptom of an illness called depression, or is feeling depressed simply the result of having low self-esteem? I mean, if you have low self-esteem, you're going to feel depressed. So we need to look at the causes of esteem. But our public health people are all trying to root out depression, which is a mythical thing. What is, what is prevalent in our society is low self-esteem amongst people because of various reasons. You know, obvious reasons like not having a job or not being loved by your parents. These are quite big things, being abandoned as a kid and being traumatised and abused. <coughs> so really, public policy because it's mind blind, it's ignore, ignoring all the data. I mean, I've worked in the health service for 30 years, and everyone with a serious mental health problem had these kind of problems. They had abuse, trauma, neglect as kids. They didn't just have magical illnesses that came out of nowhere. They had the life story which made them vulnerable to feeling bad about themselves. Not just vulnerable, but it caused them to feel bad about themselves. If you're abused and neglected as a kid, you're going to feel bad about yourself. And yet public policy ignores the role of attachments, trauma, abuse, bullying. It's, it doesn't connect all these things to mental health directly. Uh, and therefore, even when it's providing treatments for people who have mental health problems, it doesn't value relationships. So you might see the same, a different doctor every time you go. You might see a different, you never see, you never end up with the same person trying to help you in mental health. So you don't build up a secure attachment to stop feeling better about yourself. You just keep getting, going around a revolving door. So our mental health services are medicalised and depersonalised. As long as you see a doctor or a psychologist or a nurse, you're, you're regarded to have been treated. Whereas actually you need continuity of relationship. So basically, public policy ignores the meaning of, of worth that people subjectively feel. I'll just give an example. If you're disabled, for one person, the meaning of being disabled might mean they'll become a Paralympian. For someone else, it means they're going to go to Dignitas and end their life. Now, is that a medical difference, or is it a difference in the meaning that we make of our situations? Obviously, the meanings we make of our situations depend on, on our previous life history. Uh, in my experience, people who have absolutely no good input as a child probably end up not even consulting help. They just kill themselves without even listen, you know, meeting them. Uh, basically, it's and all the psychotherapists, they're all about meaning. You know, cognitive behavioural therapy about appraisal, dynamic therapy about long relationships, family therapy is about narrative. So, any kind of therapy is about trying to connect with the meaning of someone's life and to, and to look at that, to develop that. But our public health policy doesn't even address any of that stuff. So therefore, the fact that men and women might make a different meaning when they're feeling, say you abuse a, ma a male child or a female child, you might start to get differences in the way you, you respond to that, the way you act in relation to feeling bad about yourself. You might act differently or have different meaning about what it is to feel vulnerable might be different for a male and a female. These are important questions. And our public health policy is, is not really empathic, it's not personalised, it's just complete, it's completely emotionally illiterate. But just to make a point about um, the uh, questions that you might ask patients um, related to their, um, to, to their well-being, um, there, there is a move at the moment that there's kind of a campaign for all NHS psychiatric patients to be asked whether they've been, sorry, I said all, not all, um, only the women should be asked whether they've been abused at any point in their life. Um, and apparently there's no point in asking that about that. That seems to be a t another type of blindness. Yeah, another example. Did you want to take that? <laughs> Oh, okay. 
Right, so uh, let's just look at suicide and other troubles of the male gender. And as I say, we're not ignoring female troubles, there's plenty of those too. Uh, but if you look at so every, every uh, age group, every country, except I think a bit of China, every point in history since records began, you've got a greater you know, male suicide rate than female. So that's clearly a, a pattern in our species that's quite important. It's cross-cultural, it's not, you can't argue that's cultural. There's cultural variation, but the fact that in every single culture, bar one, uh, and in every single point in history, in every single age group, you've got a higher rate for male and female. It means that's an important scientific difference in our species. Any other, any other sort of scientific arena, they'd be straight on that as a massive issue. Uh, so it, using figures, I mean, you get different calculations, but you know, 78% of suicides in the UK, according to that year, were male, but it's roughly that. Uh, it's been about that for a few years. Deaths at work, 97, this is another one people find interesting. If you look at deaths at work, 97% of deaths at work are male. Which is telling us something about our society and the gender patterns of how we expect people to live. 70%, 75% of drug and alcohol addiction, that's roughly uh, a rough figure, is male. 85% of rough sleeping. You get the drift, there's all these issues. University admissions are less for males. Prison population is almost exclusively male. Uh, lower life expectancy. There's, there's, if, you're, if you're interested in health and you're interested in gender, these are things that should interest you. But this is the second blindness that we've been talking about, which all these statistics pretty much get ignored in public policy and strategy. Even though half of all citizens are male. So there's a sort of big picture that gets left out. All these elements are there. I remember once saying to the Sar for Mental Health, I think he was still the Tsar at the time, I said that Louis Appleby, I said, you know, we've got men account for the more homeless, for prisons, this, that and the other. And he said, I said, where's our strategy for men? And he said, well, we've got a strategy for prisoners, we've got a strategy for the homeless, so we don't need one. Well, it's a measure of how far we've come in the last five or six years that now with Parliament is debating us. So all of the people, you know, us, people in this room, you, we've all been chipping away at this subject and, and we're making progress. But there is an assumption that only the female gender can be vulnerable or carry disadvantages through gender. So even, like, so even the sort of fact that, the, that we've just been celebrating remembrance day with all the soldiers that died, most of whom were men. Obviously there were lots of brave female nurses and, and, and many women sacrificing many things. But the vast majority of soldiers were men. And about 40% of the soldiers in the First World War didn't have the vote. So even, even that gets ignored. So I, I think a lot of people are surprised when you say that. But actually the soldiers that died in, in the First World War didn't have the vote either. It's incredible that, I mean, the first time I heard it was when you said it about a couple of years ago. I mean, it's incredible that, that this seems to be some sort of hidden knowledge. I mean, why is that? Well, it's just because the big picture is that, that suffrage was a gender issue, but actually it's more complex than that. And of course, women didn't have the vote and needed the vote, so that's important. But the fact that the working class guys didn't have it either is kind of, you know, that gets forgotten. <laughs> And of course, once you allow for the fact that working class men didn't have the vote, uh, then the whole complexity of that narrative has to, has to be changed. And we now we have a ministry called Women and Inequalities. So the problem is that we're linking inequality on gender purely to one gender. So once you've done that, it's a blindness to the other gender. We're also more tolerant of risk and harm to adult males. Uh, and less sympathetic to the idea of a vulnerable adult male than a vulnerable woman. So what I'm saying here is that there's still a women and children first thing in our species. And if you, even if you look at, say, the, uh, the figures for survival of the Titanic, uh, I think if 97% of the women travelling first class survived the Titanic, which is quite a staggering thing, because you think the Titanic is sort of killing everybody. Actually, if 
they put the women and children first in the boats. And I think the, the men travelling first class was only about 30 something percent survived. Men travelling second class, I think only 8 percent survived. Nearly all the children survived. So there's a kind of women and children first mentality, which you could argue is a good thing. If you have that, though, you've got to be honest that that's what you're doing. So it ends up with this elephant in the room. <laughs> Usual picture. Let's put some kind of humorous picture up, but it's not a very humorous subject, really. Uh, yeah, basically, the male gender is a bit of an elephant. People kind of assume it's a, man, a man's world, but when you look at it, actually, it's not quite the case. So, hang on, I think we have that, haven't we? Yeah, we're going backwards. Oh, here we are. We've had that, let's... Hang on, where am I going back? Yes, I think it's the middle button for forwards. Oh, but it's, yeah, it's a bit. No, it's, it's. Is it? No, I'm, you know, it's the other button. Sorry about this, folks. Here we go. Right, so what are the big causes of male gender blindness then? If we are so blind to the male gender, why? Why is that? <coughs> Obviously, there's a gender narrative that it focuses mainly on female disadvantage. It's just become a sort of mainstream narrative. So it creates a sort of framework where you can't even do research unless you're funded. You're not funded, are you? Unless you you kind of go with this mainstream approach that there's female gender disadvantage and we've got to create, you've got to achieve equality uh, for, for females and therefore the assumption is that there aren't any male issues to look at. And of course there are many female issues that do need work on, so it's not that, it's just that you need to do both. And of course, what I would argue is there are male archetypes in the human species. It's become unfashionable in science now to talk about drives. You know, people talk about the maternal instincts. Oh, you know, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Freud and Jung, people like that, they talked about drives and instincts. And these, these are, what is a drive or an instinct? It's something that's a bit more than a socially learned thing. It's a kind of inbuilt in the species. And of course, I, I, I would argue that there are drives amongst men to provide and protect. On average, of course, you know, all men are the same, not all women are the same, but there is an archetype of drive in the male uh, half of the species to protect and provide, as there, as there are uh, these revolutionary pressures. And we've seen it in all the figures we've given, you know, the Titanic and everything, that, that fits that theory. So basically, society has kind of accepted that the male is, is there to provide and protect. And that's shown in those deaths at work figures, 97% of deaths at work are male, but we're not, there's no public health strategy about that, which means as a society we tolerate that because that's seen as normal because of this evolutionary pressure for men to provide and protect. Mark, in fact, um, when you uh, talked about that finding about 97% uh, of deaths being male for a police deaths, um, somebody came up to me after that talk and said, well, you know, uh, it's 97% of only a few people, um, which is a bit remarkable. I mean, it's, it's, th it's three men per week, but I mean, it, which is... Yeah, you know, it's, it's of all of the health safety executive figures for all of the worst place, uh, place deaths in the country in a year. Yeah. So it's a large number of people, but even one is, you know, it's a, it's a percentage that's based on a sample that's, that's quite big. My point being, it, just, it seems amazing to kind of quibble over that. Well, yeah, that, that it's kind of, there is this issue that, that, that it's like anything that's uncomfortable, people just want to sort of deny it. But these are facts, and they're not opinions, they are facts. So what I'm trying to say here is male mental health becomes the biggest taboo ever because it breaks four rules. The first, the first taboo about male suicide and male mental health is that it, it goes against the male archetype. If you're a man, you're supposed to be protecting everyone else. You're not supposed to be weak. So if you're, if you're a man, you stick, you, you soldier on in private with your uncomfortably shameful feelings and you kind of hope to find some solution, but you, you, it dishonors you to reveal your need. It makes you feel like you're less of a man because the male archetype is telling you you should be strong. Then you've got the, the sort of more political narrative, if you like, or the socio-political narrative that says that women, victims, women are victims, but men, men aren't victims. 
So therefore, in that narrative, men are seen as privileged and powerful, which of course some men really are, and there's no denying that, but men as a whole are seen as privileged and powerful. And that means that you can't be a man who isn't privileged or powerful, because you know, if you're suicidal, that's your fault kind of thing, or you shouldn't even be suicidal. It's not an issue to, to feel sympathetic towards, because we've got a women victim narrative, and we've got a male archetype. They're two very powerful things that collude with each other. Then the third taboo is the mind blindness. If depression is a mental illness and that causes you, you're, you're suicidal because you're depressed and you're depressed because you've got an illness and that's making you have symptoms of low self-esteem, which of course, as we said earlier, is a very bad model, but it keeps going in our society. Uh, then the meaning of suicide isn't so important. The fact that a, jet, a male and a female might interpret feeling low in different ways becomes less relevant. And then finally, it's stigma. It's stigmatizing for anyone to have a mental health problem. If you're a woman, it's stigmatizing. So for a man, it's even more so. You know, and I keep talking to the, the charity of the mental health saying, stop using this one in four, it's just rubbish. Because four in four people are suicidal. If you take away certain basic things that they need, you know, we'd all be suicidal tomorrow if certain things happened. So you can't address suicide unless you've actually recognised it as a problem and as a gender issue. If you don't think it's a gender issue, you're not going to address it. And because of our assumptions and our archetypes and our social and political policies, we're blind to male suicide, even though it's staring us in the face. So what John and I are arguing today is we need to start looking at the wood, not the trees, the bigger picture. And not so much look at men, but as our attitudes to men. And there is some change now in public attitudes, but it's slow. But as we've been saying today, there's a debate in Parliament, you know, which is great. So we are getting somewhere. But there is resistance to it. But by coming to this talk, you're part of the change, so thank you for being here. But what we're left with, if we want to address male suicide, then is two fundamental choices, I think, that we have to make. One is that we have to change men and masculinity. It's like, come on guys, open up sort of philosophy, which you see an awful lot in the charities and in mental health services. Come on guys, you're just being a bit macho. Come on, open up. Or, B, we have to change society's attitudes and responses to men and start listening to the way they're actually behaving and communicating and, and tailor our response and honour their gender. I think that's a, a really important point you're making there. That it's, it's not all just about, everyone should take some responsibility for, for their, how they're feeling, their mental health, their physical health, but really it's, it's it's not just men, it's, it's a whole cultural thing, isn't it? Yeah, we've, we've just gone through those political, social, archetypal reasons why men are in a position where it's not going to be easy for them to seek help. But if you say men aren't seeking help because men are just too macho, I mean, that's, that isn't ever going to solve it. You're actually shaming men for not seeking help. So you're shaming men if they do seek help and shaming them if they don't. So obviously, we are making the wrong choice in my view so far. It's beginning to change, and these talks that we're doing are part of that process. But even mental health charities and the professionals, and certainly the media, are going for option A, which is really this. Guys, you're emotionally illiterate. You know, you don't know how to deal with your feelings. Come on, get, you know, get a bit more emotionally illiterate. You're a bit macho. You need to open up, share your feelings, soften up, come out of the patriarchy, get into being a bit more modern man, you know, get into your feelings. The services are there, you've just got to go out and use them. That's, that's the message we're giving men, which isn't really very welcoming. And the reasons that option won't work is this, it's, for a start it's bad science, it's confusing nature and nurture, it's ignoring biology and evolution, it's dismissing differences between the genders, and it's actually treating men as emotionally illiterate, well, it's society that's emotionally illiterate. 
because society isn't sophisticated enough to see that men and women have evolved to process emotions differently. Same emotions, same importance, but the way they process them can be different. And of course, I'm, I'm not all men are the same, and I'm a guy that has been in therapy, and this, that, and the other. Most of us in this room are probably not typical because we're in this talk, but at the end of the day, there are average differences. The whole thing about science is that differences are between averages, they're not differences between everything. It confuses stereotypes with archetypes. Therefore, if you're a woman these days and you want to stay at home and raise your kids, you're regarded as some kind of failure, even though you're, you're driving, you're, you're pursuing a maternal archetype to drive to, to rear children. And if you're a man and you you want to protect people instead of be vulnerable, you're seen as some kind of Neanderthal man. We're blaming the victim here. I mean, we're telling men, you know, come on, guys, it's, you're killing yourselves, but it's your, only, it's your own fault. You should be opening up more. So, I mean, I can't think of many other messages for, for, for groups that need help that, say, that blames the people they're trying to offer the help to. Uh, then it reinforces the very attitudes to masculinity that increase suicide risk in the first place. And of course it's a double message, it's a double bind, because by, by not doing anything about deaths at work and all these other things we've highlighted, you're saying to men, it's okay for you to die at work, that's, you know, that's, that's not an issue for public health. So the ultimate double bind, I mean, uh, double bind theory, some of you know, came from sort of family therapy and Kind of, but basically, it was, um, R.D. Lang used it quite a lot to explain how people are driven mad, you know. So this is driving men mad, I think, these, this stuff of buying. This is the first, the first message is open up, talk, share your feelings, we really care about you. The second message is don't expect any sympathy, we are not really listening to or protective of males, we don't care about you. So men are getting a double message. Really interesting. I mean, there's probably a lot of scope for um, identifying several different powerful knots and binds that, that uh, are mm. around men and masculinity these days. So I think that's a very powerful double bind. <clears throat> so you're half trying to open up as a guy and half trying to sort of <laughs> protect yourself. So really the rest of this talk is about how we make option B work. So. As I say, if you don't believe in option B, look away now. Because uh, obviously I don't think option A's got much mileage in it. Option B boils down to let's respect difference. Because we do in every other field, if someone's different ethnicity, different age, different culture, <coughs> different religion, we think difference is really good. You know, We're all equal but different. When it comes to gender, we can't say that. We can't say we're equal but different. We say we're equal but we're not different, we're just equal. And because we've done that with gender, we, we've made it very hard to even look at the things which are in front of our noses. So option B boils down to let's respect differences, tune in to man needs and communication styles and adapt services to suit them rather than trying to neutralise or demasculinise males. I mean, there's a, a number of papers which have shown that Traditional psychology counselling services, mental health services, are more suited to a typical female way of dealing with distress than a male way. Obviously some men are very, I mean people like me, I spent my life doing therapy, receiving it, talking about it, but I'm not a typical male. Uh, and of course there are some women that don't like that kind of way of dealing with things either. So, but on average men are more likely to not find counselling and direct eyeballing people and talking about your feelings very easy or comfortable. It's not because they're failing to be emotionally literate, it's because it, it goes against their way of dealing and processing their issues. Option B in a nutshell is really, men aren't emotionally illiterate, they're differently literate. In other words, men are not Neanderthals. They deal with their feelings in a different way, which has a different, uh, which once you work with it, actually is equally valuable. It also means different should be respected and honoured. 
to connect with any human being or any sentient being. I mean, if you're going to rescue an animal, you think about what the animal's environment you need to get right for the animal so that they're comfortable. But with men, we think, you know, come on, guys, start doing some counselling. You're depressed. Get on with it. We don't think what's an environment that's going to suit a male client. So men have different ways of showing, communicating, responding to distress. On average, they do. Hi there. Please. No, don't worry. We've still got plenty to go. Uh, so why not offer services that take account of difference? And if we didn't do that, surely we're failing in our duty of care to agree that it's clearly at risk for all the statistics on whom other lives are both. Because you know, men, they have, they have daughters, they have sons, they have wives, partners, they have, you know, whether they're gay or straight, they have people in their lives. So if you don't sort out men, in that, we're, we're damaging all of us, because male gender is part of all of us, it's who we are, we are a gendered species. So what we've, we've got to do is start to detoxify society's attitudes to masculinity, not change men, this is the argument. And then the services will start to reflect that. What we're doing, I'm trying to explain how, how our attitudes to males have got toxic. And I think this is very important. We're taking the most extreme damaged men, who are rapists or who are killers, or who are damaged, who are extremely macho, and we're assuming that that is, that is somehow representative of the gender. <coughs> Because of that, bad men are, begin, are seen as typical rather than exceptional. I'll give you a really good example of this, which is very distressing to me and to all of us. This poor girl was raped and murdered by a very damaged man uh, recently. Her name was Inja Chipchase. And her father, when uh, he was in all the media at the time, saying, I'm never going to walk my daughter down the aisle. He loved his daughter with a passion. That was his special child, his daughter. Uh, and he was very, very moving, if you listen to him on the media. But then I was listening to many media reports covering that event. And everyone was saying, we've got to go into schools now and teach boys to respect girls. In other words, our attitudes in society, as reflected in the media, are that the rapist is more typical of a man than the father. Now that what I would be doing is going to all our schools and saying to our young boys, congratulations lads, you're going to turn out like that father. You're going to have kids and you're going to love them. A few of you are going to be damaged and you're going to be rapists. That's bad. But that's not the typical man. That's the extreme end of the spectrum. Because when men are damaged emotionally, they act in different ways than when women are damaged emotionally. And that is true. But the idea that somehow Rape is, is sort of being treated as if it's a typical thing amongst men rather than the actions of certain damaged men. It is a bit like that, um, that, that film Swipe Over at the moment, uh, The Mask You Live In, and uh, it's all about to toxic masculinity, and it kind of presents its case as if it, it applies to all men, it seems to invite all men to learn something from it. But when it gives examples of toxic masculinity, it, it, it goes to prisons, basically, or goes to mm. flat house parties and, and kind of examples of rapes and stuff like that, and crazy stuff that goes on. It, it doesn't, doesn't really, it, it seems to take a small element of, of the badness of, about some men and generalise it to all men. It seems very, very damaging, massive. Well, it's bad science, because obviously, you know, because of physiological and evolutionary reasons, all kinds of reasons, rape is, you know, something that damaged men do do. But the idea that that then becomes seen as a wider representative issue of the gender rather than as uh, a gender-specific response in certain damaged people, that's where our science goes wrong and that's where our attitudes go wrong. And of course, it's not good for our young men to receive all these kind of lectures because it's just, it, it really, it, it makes their esteem in themselves lower, or it makes them more bravado, you know, it, it kind of doesn't help. Uh, 
but blaming the male gender itself, not the emotional damage for the gender by males, some um, males respond to damage, is obviously a, a big problem. Toxic attitudes continue. I was asked to debate at the Cambridge Union as one of a number of speakers. The motion, this house believes that masculinity is harmful for everyone. <coughs> can you imagine can you imagine that motion being debated by about any other group? So again it shows that it's not men who are the issue, it's us as a society, including men. Because men see male gender like this too. Because men and women in society collectively have a view that masculinity is harmful. <laughs> the motion even was carried. <laughs> so they, not only was it debated, but they and of course the motion got distorted into macho behaviour is harmful, and of course it is. But again, can you see that even Cambridge University, which is full of fairly intelligent people, couldn't see the difference between macho men and all men. Because, you know, we get the... Uh, and again, this thing with, with misandry and, and misogyny, there's loads of misog misogyny, clearly there is, but... There was a politician, I think she was even running to become Prime Minister, wasn't she? Andrew Ledson, she said, I wouldn't leave my kids with a, a man, maybe it could be a paedophile. <coughs> so she'd gone from an extreme, tiny minority of men to all men. Some professor said something about women and men in laboratories and it not working, and he, he ends up losing his job. I don't think Andrew, I think Andrew Ledson's still in, she was never disciplined over that. So it shows that we tolerate greater sexism, even though the perception is that sexism is, is, is against women and not against men. When you start drilling down to the truth, it's both. You know, sexism works against men as well. And of course, we get the Grayson Perry sort of thing. Grayson Perry is an alpha male, so he can do what he likes. But he's used as a reason to attack masculinity rather than an example of its variability. He's a man. I mean, David Bowie was a man who liked to experiment with things because he was creative. But that's an example of men being variable, not an example of that's a good person because he's not like a typical man. I mean, it's just men, men are variable, they're not all the same. And of course, what we're not doing is celebrate. I can't think of anything in our society where we are celebrating males. I, perhaps we. This might be an opportunity for anyone to come up with an example. But even Remembrance Sunday, we didn't say thank you, males. We didn't honour the gender side of, of the soldiers. We just said soldiers, and that's you know interesting. We didn't make it a gender issue. And we don't really, I don't see anyone, anything that celebrates masculinity at all at the moment. Masculinity is either not talked about or it's talked about as a sort of toxic thing. So all these guys that sacrificed their lives for us are not honoured in their gender. Their gender is sort of airbrushed out. So I'm saying it's bad for all of us to, to get this wrong. It's not anyone, no one wins. We're a dysfunctional society if we can't honour all our members equally. So services aren't respecting, they're actually dishonouring masculinity and male gender differences. Any other group would get tailored services. And we do, you know, we have, we need to tailor services to specific groups. And as we've said before, we, there's a study there, that we are, there will be references at the end, and I think we can give copies of these slides, can't we? Mm. Anyone who wants copies of these slides can get them. And we're going to put them, and we'll put them on the Mad Psychology website, uh, www.madpsychology.org. So you can get all the references, everything. And also, you might want to go away after this talk and digest. You probably find you've got criticisms of what I'm saying. It's hard to think of a robust, isn't it? A repost in the moment, you know. And I, we need to learn from these things, but you know, we're not. This isn't all. I'm sure not everything I've said is spot on, but the point is that you need to go away and, and re re respond perhaps afterwards or, or send us some comments. I think a lot of this material will be very, very challenging for lots of people. Yeah, absolutely. It's challenging for, for me to, to talk about. <coughs> it's, it's just a different way of looking at the world. I mean, when you say it's an elephant in the room, you're saying it's something massive that people don't seem to see.
I would have that, and I can't say it for a reason. I think people yeah. are maybe quite uncomfortable about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like it. So there, may, there is positive evidence that if you get if you start to design services to fit men and you know, boys, you start getting results. So we haven't got loads of evidence because we're not doing it for the reasons we've already said, but where we are starting to do it. Campaign Against Living Miserable, you might have heard of that, Jane Powell, who's a feminist, who, I mean, it's often the feminists who are more ahead of the rest of us, weren't they, in some ways, and talking about this stuff, because they kind of felt, well, what about men? You know, they were thinking about gender more than anyone else. Uh, man Talk, Central London Samaritans, which Michael, in our audience here, was involved in setting up with me and others, and uh, we found we got the Samaritans has <laughs> actually started spending longer on the phones with men once we had we once we done a few workshops on just gender and men and how they you know we didn't teach them anything did we? we just we just ran a few mind awareness raising things and we found all the volunteers really started listening to men differently and, and the men started talking differently because they were being listened to differently. The Eaton Foundation is the, is the first mental health foundation specifically for men. Men's Shed, there's men's groups. I've run a men's group, and probably some of you have sort of run men's groups. When you start using things that men work with, like sport, like you go to sports clubs, you start to get somewhere, you start to get guys doing stuff, you know. Barbers and hairdressers, particularly in certain cultures, are a really fantastic way of connecting with men in a way that honours their gender and doesn't make them feel uncomfortable. Where you're working with, with veterans and military uh, personnel who've got suffered PTSD. If you do it in a male-friendly way, it's really effective. In, in Canada, they have a team of people, don't they, who yeah. actually work with guys in groups. They keep them in their combat units and they go through the trauma with all the guys standing around them, talking through what's going through their mind and reenacting it in a drama sort of way. But that process is the trauma. But it's a, it's a way where your, your comrades are around you. It's not sitting in a room talking to a therapist, it's, so it's a little different model. I was just going to say, um, Mara Westwood, who is the, the person you're talking about delivering that uh, combat veteran uh, program, is going to be uh, doing a uh, workshop in Britain next year. I, I think uh, Roger Kingerley is, uh, is organising that, but some, sometimes if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's an excellent opportunity to find out how to help men with combat stress. And I think you had an example, Michael, of Transport for London. Did you want to mention that? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a friend who's actually a nutritionist, and she works with men. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jessica works with men um, in Transport for London. They're the guys who, and it is actually all men, yeah, the particular she does, uh, who repair the tracks in the middle of the light. So they, they tend to do shifts from about I don't know, on the tubes, stop all the these, or about midnight till. Something like that's the shift they do. So she comes along ostensibly to be talking about nutrition, so you can go and chat about nutrition. But she finds that men, given the opportunity to sit with someone who's an empathetic listener, talk about all sorts of things which have nothing to do particularly with nutrition, like family life and the difficulties of doing very late shifts. Uh, but the point is, she comes to them. Yeah, she's, she's in that place their work. workplace. So, so no one has to know what they're talking about. And it's within the, confine, the confines of work, so they don't have to take time off together. And it's the way of the work is saying to the men, we honour you yeah. and we support you. So it's kind of. Yeah. It's and of course, like, no one's saying, come and talk about your feelings. Yeah, and no it's not saying that. They say, come and chat. And then people do, it seems, uh, feel very comfortable to just talk to them. Great. And don't, but yeah, it works. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, life's ultimately <laughs> mainly anecdotal. It's science is just adding all the anecdotes up yeah. to a big pattern. Uh, so what would a male-friendly service look like? So any days when you in this room will be hopefully contributing to the creativity of how we do this. Uh, but the evidence so far suggests we need to just, whilst not ignoring mainstream counselling therapy, it's very valuable and I've used it myself and I think a lot of men do, but because of the statistics we need to think beyond just that. Uh, I think it needs to involve no immediate pressure to express feelings, as Michael was saying there, really, in Transport for London. The guys come along with one subject and then they feel no pressure, so they segue into something that is more 
I found this with male groups, male therapy groups. You're talking about football one minute, suicide the next. But if, we, if you take the standard therapy model, which, why are we going to talk about our feelings now? Sorry, Jimmy, football. No. That's banter. Once you, once you think men who talk about football are just bantering and they're shallow and they're emotionally illiterate, you've lost the connection to your client. In psychology, uh, uh, in any kind of therapy, our aim is to connect with our client. So if someone wants to talk about football, that might be a way in to something that it would, might just be preparing the trust, a little bit of connection, and then someone's more safe to go into something deeper. So we've got to, we, we shouldn't set up services that say, right, you've got 50 minutes, talk about your feelings, I'm very pressurised, there's a long waiting list, you're a man, you're suicidal, you need to take, you know, start now, because it, it sort of doesn't work so well with men, and quite a lot of women too. Uh, we need to focus more on our story. If you, I think this is true of anyone, but this is something I often talk about with Michael. Uh, anyone is more encouraged to talk. If you ask them to talk, tell you their story, it's more, it's more, it's more inviting, isn't it? If you say, tell me your feelings. I mean, how many feelings are there? Anger, the moment, you know, what are you going to say to someone? I feel angry at the moment. I feel a bit anxious, a bit angry, a bit depressed, then where do you go from there? But if you say, tell me a story, it comes with all the context. And they say, well, this was my relationship, you know, and you start to get them to know somebody. So I think this is true of women as well. When I do therapy with women, I don't sort of ask them to tell me their feelings. I just listen to the story and women are just a bit more comfortable with going into the feelings a bit quicker. But there's no essential, I mean, as you say, people, human beings are human beings, but I think focusing on story is a much better way of doing any kind of therapy. And if you look at all the great interviewers on telly, they, they're just interested in the story of that person, aren't they? They, they bring out the story and you, and you get interested in the audience if you're watching it, but if, if you look at bad interviews on the media, they say, how did you feel? You know, and then the person, you can see the person shrinking, because they don't, what, what can you say? Uh, and banter is a male, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's male language. Men use humour, a lot of banter. Men actually call each other ghastly words as a sign of, of love. When a man wants to show love to another man, he swears at him quite often. And unless you get the language of your client group right, you're never going to help them. And that's what the, the, the charity campaign against living miserably does very well. It, it uses uh, male culture, you know, rap, rappers and street, uh, street credible young men to, to use the language of male living, not medicalised sort of terms of mental health. It, it, I think one of their adverts is, are you feeling shit? Call this number. It doesn't say, do you have clinical depression on three points on the... DSM-4. <laughs> it just says you're feeling shit. Because when someone jumps off a bridge, they're not really interested in how many criteria they meet for DSM-4. Yeah. And it uses male camaraderie. Men are very loving. I mean, they're loving to their kids, but they, they might show it through protecting, providing, doing things. Men show love all the time. Uh, they show love by sacrificing, by protecting. They have camaraderie with other men in ways which are very, very, very valuable. So this idea that they're all sort of Neanderthals, emotionally illiterate, they're all sort of avoiding emotion. Actually, no, they're showing emotion in a male-specific way. So we've got to use activities that appeal to men. I'm trying to sort of set up some male-friendly <laughs> services with, in a drug and addiction service. And, just have a place where they can come and watch movies, talk to each other, play, you know, have a chill out at the gymnasium. You start to get feelings from people, or you start to get processing stuff. Incidentally, to doing things, you don't have to just be sitting there waiting to process an emotion. You get to process by doing stuff. Uh, you want to honour and validate all your clients. So with men, you have to do it in a, in a male-friendly way. You use the male archetypes rather than trying to attack the archetype, you go with it. The most obvious way to, as I say at the bottom here, the most obvious way to 
go with the male archetype is to say seeking help is taking control, is being a man. So if we say to men, if you seek help, you're taking action, you're doing something, you're a man. Not, come on guys, you don't have to be so macho anymore, just be vulnerable. If, if, we, if we frame our message as strength, and that's the truth anyway, isn't it? It is, it is much, you know, it's a sign of greater strength to sort of seek help. So we've got to make it easier to do it. It is difficult for men to seek help, but it's even, it becomes impossible if we frame it to them as they've got to be, go against their own archetypes. And of course, as I, as I say there, we should be getting alongside men more than getting inside. I mean, if, if, you, if you drive in a car with a, with a guy or walk beside them, you'll get much more out of them than if you sit face to face. Just go for a drive. You know, we, we don't design services in a way that enables these ways of connecting with men to be more subtle. Right, at this point, I think I'll hand over to you, John. Brilliant. Thank you, Rick, for your attention. Um, thanks very much, Martin. I, I think um, I'm on very safe ground saying that uh, the field psychology has got a lot of catching up to do. Um, uh, Martin is uh, way ahead of virtually everybody in the field. I mean, we really do need to have a big wake up in psychology. And one of the main reasons is because of uh, the, the, the suicide epidemic, you might say, um, and the fact that uh, it seems, uh, it's about three or four times higher in men than women seems to be lost on most people, including psychologists. They think that psychologists might be a bit more clued in than other people, a bit more sensitive perhaps. That doesn't seem to happen, not today at least anyway. Um, what we've done, myself and Martin, back in 2011, we decided that, that we were going to get together uh, with a few other people and try and do something proactive about this. Uh, and do it as, as uh, psychologists um, and to try and use our, um, our skills, our, our ability, our, our, I suppose our standing as psychologists to, to try and do something concrete. We set up the um, Male Psychology Network and, um, and this is our conference at UCL that we have this year. Uh, some of you might uh, recognise brilliant people like uh, this. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, like uh, Warren Farrell here. There's Warren at the back. Uh, Marv Westwood is there somewhere too. Um, but I, I would encourage if you if you are interested in male psychology, you should definitely come to the conference next year. John, I'm there as well. Those who want to know. Okay, and Vincent is there too. <laughs> of course. That's, that's the first thing people notice, Vincent. <laughs> so, okay, so um, we've got about 40 members. We're, we're quite a small uh, organization, about a third of us women. And uh, we've campaigned successful, well, almost successfully to create a male psychology section of the British Psychological Society. And we're really, I mean, there's a lot of people to thank for that. Some of them are here today. And uh, it, it, that will be a massive step forward for what we want to achieve. Um, we've got, we have our annual conference, uh, as I said, uh, 23rd, 24th of June next year. Um, we've, uh, based on the conference this year, there's a special issue of female studies um, going to come out uh, in the next few weeks. And this is uh, freely available online. You can read about some of the different uh, studies that were presented at, at that conference. And uh, uh, you know, some, some of it is quite good. Uh, I hope I wrote some of it, so I think it's quite good. Um, we've got a handbook of male psychology coming out soon. And uh, we've got, we're fairly active in terms of research, given the, the size of the group. And here's some of our publications in the last two years. Uh, so the kind of things that we're interested in, primarily, I mean, I think we, our starting point, Martin, is suicide. It's just yeah, like, yeah. Like, such an urgent issue, such an urgent issue. Um, so part of what we've been thinking is, is suicide just to do with demographics or just to do with kind of bits and pieces of other variables? Or maybe it's something about the way that men 
think in the kind of gender typical terms that might make us more prone to, to being suicidal. So that's one of our questions. And uh, based on the fact that, that men seem to experience a lot of mental health problems, as shown by the suicide rates, and maybe shown in other ways, like by uh, drinking more, more violence, some of the things like that. Um, and the fact that men aren't going to therapy as much as women, we've, we've also decided we need to focus on whether we need to make therapy more male friendly so that men actually decide to go and seek help in some sort of way if, if they are feeling stressed. So then, that's taken up some of our other uh, time. Um, so, yeah, so and as a kind of a, an add on to that, really, um, is the, and I think, growing realization that in some ways that the model that we have of, of therapy, psychological type therapy, might not really suit men all that well, by and large, in general. Uh, and there are maybe other things that men do to, uh, to feel better about themselves and their life and uh, the world around them. And it might not be sitting and talking to somebody about their feelings. Uh, I, in a way, I hate to say this because I'm a kind of, you know, as a, as a psychologist, this is not a brilliant thing. I'm saying, saying that lots of our clients would be better off going off and doing something different. But well, well, let's see what happens with our research. So, one of our first studies uh, with Martin and Luke Sullivan, uh, we did a large survey. Um, we looked at how much uh, male and female gender scripts, which is uh, Martin's concept, um, had an effect on suicide thinking, or I should say, are related to suicide thinking. Um, and what we found was that. Uh, the male, there's, uh, the male gender script of, of needing to be a fighter and a winner, so needing to be very competitive in life. Um, the more people thought that they needed to be very competitive, um, the more that they, they said that they felt suicidal. Okay, so that was one correlation. And this is controlling for lots of other variables too. And this is, by the way, this applies to men and women. It's not, not just men thinking this. Um, also, we found that mastering control, uh, and by that I mean uh, needing to control your feelings, not being, not feeling comfortable in just sort of talking about how you feel. The more you felt that you needed to be in control of your feelings, and the more suicidality people reported to. So the, these were, were two of our first findings. We also found quite interestingly that one of the uh, what we call female gender scripts, and that is. Um, having a strong interest in family and children and, and placing a lot of importance in that in your life. Um, more, interested, more interested in family harmony uh, was related to less suicidality. So it seems that that kind of, that, what we call female typical gender script of family harmony seems to be protective against suicidality. And so we published that in 2014 and we've recently uh, replicated that, that survey and we're, we're getting broadly similar findings. Um, there, there seem to be some uh, differences, but we'll tell you about that at, uh, at another talk. Um, now, another study that we're just getting, I mean, th this is all very hot off the presses type data that you're going to see now. Um, no, hang on, it is some of this and some of this published. Okay, so um, we, we thought it would be a good idea in finding out whether therapy works just the same for men as it does for women, uh, that we should ask different therapists their opinions. Like, so actually go to, um, say for example, life coaches, as in this first study here, and ask them whether they thought men and women um, benefited from the same sorts of techniques, or whether um, therapists have found that men and women might uh, respond better to different sorts of techniques. Um, so we interviewed 20 life coaches, and we found that 90% of them reported sex differences in some aspect of therapy. Um, and what we didn't expect to find, but was quite interesting, that about two thirds of them um, reported some sort of uh, unease about reporting that they'd seen sex differences in their clients. Uh, we also looked at, we did a small study of therapists, 100% uh, reported sex differences in their clients in terms of responding to different techniques or seeking help through different routes, etc. 
and we've uh, just completed a study, we're about to submit it tomorrow as a matter of fact to a journal, um, of uh, 20 psychologists and psychotherapists and counsellors. Um, so uh, I think probably most of them will be members of the British Psychological Society, so BPS has to take notice of this. But, um, 100% of them reported uh, gender differences in some aspect of uh, client needs. Um, and what we found in that study was that men, by and large, men wanted a quick fix from therapy and women <coughs> wanted to explore their feelings. Women wanted to take a lot of time just to, to kind of talk about how they're feeling. And 80% of the therapists, uh, again, showed ambivalence uh, when they reported on sex differences. Um, and so that, that, because it came up again in another uh, set of interviews with therapists, this thing of, of saying, yeah, well, I see men want this and men want that, but showing some sort of uh, unease about it, we thought that, that was quite an interesting thing. In fact, if, if you think about it, um, a lot of what Martin's been talking about is related to this, this kind of unease that we saw in the therapists. So, um, so typically, uh, in fact, the, the title of the, our first paper on um, interviews with therapists was I hate generalizing, but... So typically, people would say things like, I hate generalizing, but I prefer this, and, then, and women prefer that sort of technique. And this was often a kind of men prefer a quick fix, so women prefer to talk about their feelings type of thing. Um, and we, we tried to understand what was going on here, and we thought that there's probably what we're seeing is cognitive dissonance uh, being shown uh, or, uh, by these therapists. In other words, they're, they're seeing something, they, they, they have the evidence of their own eyes to inform them of some particular thing. But there's some other part of them that, that's trying to sort of block them from seeing that. They, like, and so they feel unease, there's, there's dissonance uh, within them when they try and tell you about these experiences. Um, so this is a well-known um, type of phenomenon in psychology. Um, we also thought it was interesting that we were seeing what's called beta bias. Beta bias doesn't get talked about very much in psychology. Um, psychology is often more interested in talking about alpha bias. Alpha bias is when um, somebody uh, overemphasizes sex differences. Uh, beta bias is, is where uh, <coughs> sex differences are ignored or minimized in some sort of way. And I think what we were seeing was people struggling um, with beta bias. That they were having, a, they wanted to tell you about what they experienced uh, in seeing their patients respond to different techniques, but they felt uncomfortable about it because they felt that they needed to minimize these sex differences. Um, and also, uh, one very powerful thing, I think, is what's called the gender similarities hypothesis. There was a very influential paper by Janet Hyde uh, in 2005. Um, this was a meta-analysis of sex differences um, for various aspects of uh, psychology, uh, cognition, and behavior. And um, Janet Hyde did all, a, a kind of a big kind of a table of, I can't remember, about 45 or so different variables. And she found that, that in most cases there was no significant differences between men and women. Okay, there were some significant differences, but what she said was that uh, there are more similarities and differences. So the, she decided that, in fact, these, these, we can kind of say that pretty much men and women are the same psychologically. Um, for people like me, who maybe suffer a bit from alpha bias and are interested in sex differences, what I'm thinking is, well, hang on a second, what about the sex differences? What about the differences? I mean, are they important differences? Are they uh, differences in, in important areas that might, you know, inform us about something about humanity or maybe even have clinical importance in understanding suicidality or, or depression or acting out of, of, uh, of various emotions? Um, Janet Hyde wasn't that interested in, in those sorts of ideas. Um, although she said in the paper we should recognize uh, moderate differences, so moderate effect size differences are, are things we should recognize. Um, in fact, she, she had found for mental rotation ability, and that's the, the ability to imagine an object 
from various angles. Like, so if you can imagine a, a kind of a, a, an irregular stack of cubes and you're showing one side of it, and if you're able to actually imagine what the other side of it might look like and, and imagine it accurately, that means you're quite good at mental rotation. And men tend to be better at this than women to a kind of a moderate effect size, as, as they call it. Now, Janet Hyde found that. Um, but she, she kind of, although she said that, that she was interested in moderate effect size differences, she didn't explore that any further and simply kept on uh, talking about how men and women were overall similar. Now, th there might be all sorts of, of effects of uh, By the way, uh, with um, our research team at the, the Male Psychology Network have just uh, submitted a paper, a meta-analysis of mental rotation ability in, in boys and girls um, as young as three months old and, uh, and we find that there is a, 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 at least a moderate effect size even in young children which is, this kind of suggests that if, if it exists at even three or four months old it's probably innate to some degree um, but th this is probably not going to make us very popular with people like Janet Hyde who would rather not have anything to do with those things because you might imagine, for example, that there might be an impact of, uh, on, across the lifespan of, of, uh, of having particular skills and abilities. Um, so, uh, but this, this is not a popular idea to, to discuss. Um, so what we've kind of ended up, I think, with is a bunch of people, psychologists, who should be able to help with things like male suicide and, and be empathic to the needs of their clients, uh, but instead they're led to be uh, uh, basically not seeing important gender differences, even when they're clinically important. Um, so we're left with what Martin has called male gender blindness, uh, what Rick Bradford has called the, the gender empathy gap, uh, which is where you, you're kind of blind to differences uh, um, in the experiences of men and women, for example, in terms of suicide, you just don't see it. And there's a kind of a, if, a, if, a, if something bad happens to a woman, uh, we're more likely to have some sort of sympathy or empathy for that person than if, it, if the same thing happens to a man. So all the, the list of workplace deaths and all, and all those other things, um, that they could be examples of, of uh, where we, we see gender empathy gaps in daily life. Okay, so now here's the, the new data add, and some of this is, is kind of interesting. Uh, we want to find out from men and women um, what they liked about various types of therapies, like uh, whether they liked cognitive behavioural therapy more than uh, psychodynamic therapy, what type of therapist they like, what kind of conditions they wanted to do the therapy in. What we just thought it would be important maybe to kind of throw it out to the general public. Um, all these questions and see what they said. So this is quite exploratory. Um, so we asked them, uh, we asked about 250 men and women, uh, if you had a mental health problem, what kind of treatment would you prefer? And we controlled for, for various variables that could explain it to some degree, like we, we controlled for things like age and uh, educational level. And we found, <coughs> annoyingly for people like Janet Hyde, quite likely, that uh, women significantly preferred, it's not, not a massive difference, but statistically significantly preferred psychodynamic type therapies. Um, so, so when they were asked how much they liked them, they said that they liked them more than men said they liked them. Whereas men said that they significantly preferred um, support groups more than women. Okay, so these are significant differences in preferences for therapy. Um, we asked other things, um, so other aspects of, uh, of therapy, in, uh, like in general group therapy. Men also prefer group therapy in general. And that's controlling for lots of other factors. Sex differences in coping strategies. As, uh, yeah. uh, so women significantly uh, liked self-help books as a way of coping with, with stress more than men. Uh, they liked to talk with friends significantly more than men did, and they like to comfort significantly more than men did. We're taking up our arts and crafts more than men, or prescription medication. Men, on the other hand, 
uh, as ways of dealing with stress. I liked significantly more than women uh, playing Xbox with two friends. Trigger warning for the next one. Cover your eyes if you're sensitive. Have sex or use pornography as a way of coping with stress. So the, the triggers to help seeking are important too because a lot of men um, who commit suicide might not commit suicide if they were able to seek help more effectively. So we're interested in the triggers to help seeking. Uh, women uh, said that they went to seek help when they became aware that they needed help and that then when it had a, an impact on their daily life. So they said that they did these things significantly more than men said that they did. Uh, whereas men said, more than women, that uh, they said that in general, men don't admit to their problems. So we, we also try and fix the problems ourselves. And interestingly, men more than women said there are no male-friendly options in therapy. Okay. Now, should we be listening to this? I mean, I think perhaps we should. Or maybe these are just annoying sex differences that, that we should just not take any notice of. So, do people want a male therapist? This was something that came up in the British Psychological Society's uh, journal uh, recently. Um, the question came up, um, <coughs> men are underrepresented in, uh, in psychology, we need more male therapists. So when we asked our uh, kind of general public what they thought, um, most people, about two thirds of men and women, didn't mind whether it was a male or female therapist. And it's kind of proportionally more women preferred a female therapist than men said we'd like a female therapist. But then significantly more men than women said they prefer a male therapist. Now this is significantly more men than women prefer a male therapist. The numbers are huge here. So it's only 17% of men said they prefer a male therapist. So it's a minority of men. But then again, this could be the, the men who maybe are most at risk. We don't really know. This is for another study to find out. But all we can see is that there, there are certainly fewer male therapists than there are female therapists. And when we ask men in the general public, they're saying, oh, oh by the way, about half of, of the, the people in the survey have been, to, have been in therapy before, and half of them had experienced mental health problems. So these are people who kind of, at least half of them have some experience of this, and they prefer a male therapist. Okay, so um, we did ask, for, for those who might be interested in research methods and statistics, we did ask um, people a lot of questions. We threw, threw a lot of questions at people in, about various aspects of therapy. And um, not all of them came up uh, significant. And uh, if, if I was Janet Hyde, I would be saying, well, in most cases, there was no sex difference. So men and women need some therapy or they're interested in therapy. Yeah, there's nothing there. Um, in fact, um, you would expect three significant sex differences out of the number of variables we were asking about to occur by chance. In fact, we found 15 different sex differences, um, which is fairly well above chance. And interestingly enough, it's um, similar to a study that looked at, uh, in 2011, looked at sex differences in outcomes in uh, tr psychological treatments for depression. So there might be something there Okay, so one other question then is if men don't go to therapy, and are they, uh, I mean, maybe they're going somewhere else for uh, some sort of ad hoc kind of therapy instead, uh, or they're doing something that, that they find useful and stress relieving for them. Uh, so, and this has been put into the kind of concept of therapy. Behavioral activation therapy is about finding out what people enjoy doing and then enjoy encouraging them to do that. Often when you're depressed you stop doing the things that you, that you normally enjoy doing. So that's a kind of like a therapy without any real therapy in a sense. Um, an interesting study a few years ago found that uh, middle-aged men in Glasgow got quite a lot of, of uh, a sense of uh, therapeutic value from going down the pub and talking to their friends. 
um, really interesting paper. And it kind of makes sense when you live it. Like you, when you have a couple of drinks, you might open up a little bit more, talk a bit more about your feelings and your issues. And it's a kind of a safe kind of uh, environment in, in some ways because people are expected to do that a bit. Um, so men's sheds is a kind of a popular thing now where it's, I, I think men's sheds would definitely not describe themselves as any kind of therapy, but it's just a place where men can go and what you might call potter around, uh, doing various things like making furniture together. And in the process of just doing something together, they chat a bit and say how they feel or kind of, you know, things like that that they wouldn't normally feel like doing if you just sat them down and asked them how they feel. Um, another one that came up at the, the conference last year um, was the idea that, that black men actually like to chat and um, kind of have, a, you know, deal with their problems at the barbershop. Um, and when I first heard that, I just thought, I mean, I don't really believe that because I hate going to the, to the barber. It's just boring, you know, it's, just, it's slightly tedious. And I, I don't really like talking to the barber either, usually. It's kind of annoying, it slightly makes me cringe, slightly, especially if there's a bit of a, a, a cue. So, but I thought, okay, I'm, I'm a, a psychologist and a researcher, I should maybe investigate this and say, see whether maybe these black guys do in fact get some sort of well-being benefits from this sort of going to the barber. So, uh, we did a study, it's just about to be published in email studies in a couple of weeks' time. Um, uh, we asked a, a hundred, uh, sorry, 200 people um, their opinions about going to a barber shop and how much they got out of it and what they, they did when they got there and uh, basically asked them in various ways about how much they felt better as a result of going to a barber shop. So we found that control for age, um, black men socialise and talk more at the hair, at the hair stylist or barbers significantly more than uh, white men or black or white women. And, and the talk, importantly, was about health or personal issues. And uh, it's kind of slightly nice graph here. Even if you don't like graphs, this tells you a lot. This is kind of, this is how much you, you uh, socialize and talk at the hairstylist. And this is like, the, the lower numbers mean you like it less. This is me down here, basically. <laughs> uh, this is black guys having a great time. <laughs> having a much better time than me. Uh, this is uh, women who are white and women who are black, who kind of seem to have, according to the study, exactly the same sort of level of chatting and socialising. But uh, I think there's some, maybe something quite important going on there. And uh, quite apart from me feeling a bit envious of, of uh, these black guys having a much better time without their haircut, I think that there really might be something worth investigating there in terms of using. Uh, the, the potential of everyday activities as, as ways of offering men some sort of relief from whatever sort of stress they're experiencing and not expecting them just to sort of, you know, feel, you know turn up to a psychotherapist or a counsellor or something like that because that doesn't seem to be working too well. So I think uh, we're back to the conclusions. Uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's about, I think, uh, it's brilliant that you're all here, it really is. I mean, if we did this talk a couple of years ago, we might not have got anybody. It would be me speaking to Martin and Martin <laughs> speaking back to me. It would be a lonely experience. Uh, but it's, it's great that things are taking off to some degree. Uh, um, and the fact that we have a second international men's state debate in Parliament is something to, to really feel encouraged by. And, uh, I suppose in conclusion, I, I think this thing of male gender blindness, I mean, that not being able to see that when issues are facing men, I think is a, a really important barrier. And we have to, I guess it's up to people like us who, whose eyes are open a bit to be able to talk to other people and maybe, if necessary, challenge other people to, to see things a bit more clearly. Um, and maybe in a few years' time, it will become the norm for people to say, hang on a second, but, you know, the suicide rate in this country is a bit higher and this area is a bit higher uh, and it seems to be many males. What are you doing about that? You know, I'm talking to the government saying, look, you, you've tried to, you've got policies for all sorts of other health issues. Why aren't you doing this about suicide? And it's hard for that specifically about male suicide. So, um, 
So I, I'm not going to kind of go on about that, but just to say that um, if you do want to see uh, uh, all the, the notes and briefings that they're going to be talking about in Parliament today, or have been talking about in Parliament today, you can download them for free from here. And, uh, and this um, presentation itself will go onto the Male Psychology website so you can access it. The talk will be on the website in maybe a week or two weeks, depending on how quickly we can get, get it posted up there. Um, but do visit the website, you can download the various papers we've been talking about today. And, uh, and hopefully, if, if you are interested in, in um, counselling or psychology or, or helping people who are having mental distress, uh, helping men and boys who are having mental distress, I should say, um, you might even uh, consider signing up to become a member of the Men's Psychology Network. Um, it's a kind of broad church and <clears throat> we can all work together very effectively to, to move things forward. So, Martin, would you like to... to no, no, I think you've said it all and we've gone 8 o'clock, so we Brilliant. probably need to wind, wind up just to thank everyone for coming and for making this an enjoyable experience and obviously we have prob probably if people have one or two questions maybe we should take a couple of questions because okay. probably we've been throwing all this stuff at you so does anyone have any quick points yeah, I have a question about um, uh, the importance of how we conceptualize the gender differences and oh, <laughs> and, um, oh I can hear my voice how we think about um, where the gender differences came from because um, in a couple of times in this um, talk and also in your article from the BPS gender issue, you said um, that perhaps it's time to respect these gender phenomena as genuine differences within the human condition rather than as mere social stereotypes. And I guess my question is what difference does it make to consider them as coming about through biological drives rather than being socially constructed? Could you not perhaps view them as socially constructed but still real and still worth the time to be thought about and still not something that you can force a, a man to change or to fit within a feminized model, like just because you see them as coming about through social constructionism doesn't necessarily mean that you um, consider them less real. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, if we're making the point about social construction, we're not uh, certainly not making the point that that is less real. Uh, it's just the level at which we've got to deal with something. So. The way I'm looking, the, the way I'm sort of framing our whole talk tonight is that we need to socially construct our attitudes to masculinity differently. So I'm arguing that we should uh, reconstruct our attitudes to masculinity, and that is very real because our attitudes to masculinity are changeable, uh, and, and uh, it's our attitudes to masculinity that, that are probably the greatest barrier. But clearly, Things uh, the human species, as I see it, as biological, psychological, social, political, and spiritual. I think all of those elements are important. They they all interact. So we're not trying to play down the importance of social constructions, but which what we're trying to do is redress the balance a little bit because it's so often talked about as a social construction gender that it, it gets. We need to sort of redress that balance. For example, uh, even if you assumed if some of these things were socially constructed. And we've got to understand, we've got to think about why we're doing that. What, and also, male children are largely socialised by adult females. And we've got to think, well, if we're socially constructing gender in these ways, why, are, why, why is that happening? Do you see what I mean? The, 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 large, the largest part of influence over young males is, is, is adult females. Social. So we're communicating and transmitting stuff then. But the important thing is that... Uh, it's no uh, social constructions are. I mean, someone who's deluded and psychotic is that's a real. A delusion is real. Any belief is real. If you believe something, it's real for you. Uh, so uh, the important thing is that we're not playing down the importance of social construction. But for me, if we we're splitting gender from its biological heritage, the, the other way of looking at it is it's mind body. We're really saying that. The body is, is biological sex and the mind is gender. If you look at it in that crude way, uh, are we really saying our minds and our bodies are separate? I think they're much more intertwined than that. So I would say the psychology of gender has got to be uh, connected with the biology of sex. And we've got to sort of link the two rather than split them off. 
and in, certainly in, in psychology generally, we've got it the wrong way around. In mental health, we, we think people are suffering from biological illnesses, but in gender, we, we've got a sort of cons a belief that that gender is more fluid, whereas mental health is somehow biologically determined. So we've got it completely the wrong way around. So yeah, the, these things have to be debated, but you're totally right. It doesn't matter whether it's constructed or or in some way a part of a, an archetype, it's still got to be addressed. It's still a genuine difference. So you, I think you're quite right about that. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, and I do agree, kind of is irrelevant in a way, like where it comes from. It's just addressing it is an important thing. Uh, as an aside, I, I do think um, that there's a, a very good book by uh, Professor Melissa Hines, who's based at Oxford, called Brain Gender. And that's about how it's an interaction between the two things. It's a bit of nature and it's a bit of nurture. It's not not just nature or not, and it's not just nurturing. But uh, th it's very evidence based for for the influence of both on gender. Um, uh, so you made it clear that we should adapt our therapies towards um, the sex differences between uh, the genders, but do you not also think it's important to acknowledge the role that culture plays and society plays in um, very much um, forcing the ideas um, from a young age in boys that, especially in fairy tales and stories, that boys should be strong and hide the feelings and not express themselves and sort of see the side that that is also very harmful and not just acknowledge that yeah there's sex differences and we should adapt to them but also try to destroy the society that builds on those sex differences and amplifies them. Yeah I absolutely think that uh, if you look at uh, male you know, I suppose if you look at cultural, uh, there is cultural change and I suppose we are looking at working from both directions. So definitely uh, we want to enable men to feel good about expressing and, and dealing with their emotional lives as much as possible culturally. But this is what we're proposing that to do that we need to do it in a way that also fits so that you're getting a win-win, you're getting cultural change by using the archetype to go with the kind of cultural... So by creating services that are more male-friendly, you will have more men talking about their feelings because they'll be, they'll be feeling more honoured and they'll be going into more therapy and therefore they'll be starting to talk more and it'll be accepted as a male-friendly thing to do. But because you've, because you've come in at it from both ends, you're going to be more likely to succeed. Whereas the danger is by just coming in at the cultural end, you're going to sort of make men feel under pressure to be different. Uh, so you can get a win-win there. Obviously, what I said earlier is true that uh, suicide rates are different in every culture. So there is something inherent in the species. You know, every single culture, the suicide rates are much higher. There's something in our species that... that, that uh, needs to be addressed and each obviously you've got to do it uh, in a way that's culturally sensitive but uh, if you can allow people men to come in in a way that feels honors their those ancient kind of universal species based aspects of masculinity then you will find you will get as much change as you can get in terms of feeling honored to talk about feelings because I think Michael you were saying in transport for London these guys came in to talk about nutrition to a, to a female uh, nutritionist in trans